right, so this video is the third in a series that I'm doing, um, listing every Genesis song in personal order of preference with an explanation for why it is where it is and a little bit of a review and some thoughts on it. Short in some cases, long in others. If you haven't already seen the first two videos, it's probably a good idea to start at the beginning. Um, there's a playlist that I have up now. It begins at number 179. So if you haven't seen the series up to now, uh, go start at the beginning and come back. As always, I am Hans Berger of the band Electric Brain, Electric Shadow. We do uh, moody art rock, which is highly informed by, among other things, a lifetime of listening to Genesis of all eras. Uh, check us out wherever you buy or stream music online. That being said, here goes. So kind of an interesting, um, I guess, factoid here, and I, I try to mostly avoid too much personal stuff, but the uh, interesting thing about this song is that after 25 years of Genesis fandom, uh, while compiling this list, I was able to look at every song and immediately remember, just from the title, pretty much everything about the song, right? The melody and lyrics and arrangement structure. Uh, except this song was the only one out of all 179 that I, I couldn't immediately pull up in my head from seeing the name. I actually had to go back and listen to it for a little bit and go, oh yeah, yeah, that one. And I think in a lot of ways that's because this is kind of like the archetypal from Genesis to Revelation song. It's a folky ballad with a melody that is nice, but at the same time not amazing. The lyric has some interesting moments, some really clever uh, imaginative turns of phrase, some good images. At the same time, it doesn't quite cohere into anything that totally works as a unit. It also has some kind of awkward clusters of syllables that are pretty much impossible to imagine being sung smoothly. The backing vocals are notably unhelpful, and the strings can fuck off. And most of those qualities, to one extent or another, are, are typical of most of the songs on that first album. At least, maybe, you know, the, the ones that aren't especially outstanding. I would say that the best qualities of this song are probably easier to appreciate on the, uh, the version that's on the compilation 50 Years On, which turns down the strings, turns down the backing vocals, but does keep that French horn melody, which I think is actually an effective addition. It kind of seems maybe more, more than some of the other songs here, like it mostly just exists to serve Jonathan King's concept, and of course that concept kind of falls out of the picture after the first third of the album anyway. Again, the melody here is nice, though not world-class. Uh, if the strings maybe are, if the strings feel more intrusive here than usual, it's probably because maybe the band isn't doing as much to distract attention from that addition. Overall, there are a lot of cool things on this album. I don't mean to play that down. And you can make an argument that maybe the album as a whole is a bit underrated. Probably not based so much on this song. Now, I know a lot of people are really fond of We Can't Dance as a whole. And um, I don't want to be too mean to it, but this song in particular has kind of always seemed to me like... It's just kind of lukewarm in every part of it, right? The, the sentiment in the lyric is kind of a lukewarm version of a protest lyric. Um, the, the playing is just kind of has a, a sort of half-baked quality to it. The melody is mm, good enough, right? So I mentioned the concept for this first album a little while ago. If you're watching this video, you probably know the story of this album and the role that the producer Jonathan King played in, um, among other things, dictating kind of a half-baked concept that comes into play at the beginning for the Genesis part, but doesn't really come back in at the end for anything like a Revelation scene. Now, this, of course, is the act of creation illustrated in music, and I think the lyric actually achieves that very well. It has a surprisingly vivid imagistic quality. It has some interesting rhymes. Uh, it, it flows more smoothly in how the syllables are laid out than some of the other lyrics on this album in particular. But the music, unfortunately, doesn't really come anywhere near that kind of grandeur, right? At this point, they don't have the 
compositional skills or the technical skills, and Jonathan King isn't giving them the sonic range to really evoke the scale of what they're talking about. So ultimately, it feels like the work of really smart, really talented kids who, you know, at the same time are kind of being outmatched by the scale of what they're being asked to do. This is notable as the first Genesis song ever released. It's really quite unremarkable otherwise. The lyric feels a little forced. The melody is kind of obvious, probably more so than a lot of the other melodies on the album, which are a little bit more creative. And they're really, at this point, none of them had really figured out a distinctive instrumental identity or how to do anything surprising with an arrangement. Whatever criticism you might level at the whole first album, uh, it does at least have a lot more imagination than this. So this, of course, is an early single B-side, and uh, I've put it a bit higher than some of the other weak, super early songs, just because it is so damned weird. The verse has kind of a, a zombies-ish groove to it that I like, but then the lyrics are a essentially about realizing you're a sad, shriveled old man. Uh, the chorus is sort of this paranoid, frail shout. The delivery almost reminds me a bit of, like, um, that old song, They're Coming to Take Me Away. So it's a really odd mix of elements in terms of, you know, the, the kind of instrumental bed and how that relates to the lyric and then how the, the vocal delivery kind of clashes with that instrumental vibe. Ultimately, it's really amazing to listen to this and, and think that anybody could write this, record this, and think, ah, this is, this is what the record-buying public wants. This will make our fortune. But I do actually really kind of adore and appreciate that sense of oddity about it and the, how it has even more of a left-field quality than a lot of the other stuff from this very early period. So we're jumping all the way to the other end of their career here. This is a Calling All Stations B-side. It's one of the more obscure B-sides from that album. Um, I think maybe even a lot of hardcore fans might not have heard it. I'll say this for it. Um, it doesn't sound like any other Genesis song. The production is kind of flat and stripped and sounds like, um, like the world's most sterile version of the idea of roots rock. And I think that the lyric is about a woman describing to her father the process of being seduced by a cult leader. And it is, uh, it is actually a pretty dark, enigmatic lyric. I actually think it's lyrically one of the more effective songs from the Calling All Stations sessions. You know, sonically, um, the kind of, the, the sort of almost flat, cardboardy kind of quality to it is not appealing, but different at least, you know? I think this, you know, uh, along with the next song, which I'll, I'll get to momentarily, if nothing else, you know, they, they do more than a lot of the other stuff from this era of really making a, a convincing case of something new that the band could do with itself. Now, it is possible that I may be giving this song too much credit for being distinctive within the larger catalog, but still. So this is a B-side from the same single as Papa, he said, which was the last song. Um, in terms of style and quality, it's pretty much identical with the difference that this time the arrangement is built around the banjo setting on Tony Banks's keyboard, and the lyric is about a despairing busker. Now, actually, those two things uh, sound like they should make it totally different from the last song, but... Um, the mood, the production quality, the kind of uh, flat, compressed sound, the, the sparseness are very, very similar. As with the last song, I'd say this is actually kind of mystifyingly good for what it is, and a really interesting, overlooked kind of oddity in the catalog. One of the more immediately memorable songs on From Genesis to Revelations. It has some nice piano melodies. It has a fairly effective chorus that actually works pretty well despite the backing vocals. Uh, I think it's one of the more effective uses of that backing vocal chorus here, which is a very common technique on that album. Probably comes across better in some spots than others, but they're using it relatively well here. 
On the other hand, the strings do get in the way. So like I've mentioned, you know, this album, it has some wonderful things on it, right? And there's some things on it that will reappear very close to the top of this list. But it also has a lot of songs that just have a little bit of a thin quality, right? Where the, the sound and the arrangements kind of don't have the fullness and the punch that they feel like they should. The emotions don't come across quite as much as they should. And it feels less like a matter of laziness and more just kind of like a little bit of tiredness and dissipation of energy. This song is really sort of the poster child for that effect, right? It captures some real wistfulness while it's playing. It has a nice melody. The The backing vocals, I think, are pretty effective here. You know, the oohs that Phil does are, are a nice touch. But there's ultimately just not too much going on in the way that the song is played. It all just kind of dries up and blows away as soon as it's over. Also, the lyric uses the end rhyme change and rearrange, which is like officially the most predictable, awkward, uh, cliched rhyme. And anytime anybody does that, even somebody I respect and admire a lot, it's got to knock it down a point. 